to Zooming In, Form, Pixel, Movement, and Story, a presentation of work by uh, Mercury 20 artists, Chris Kamater, Kathleen King, Mary Curtis Ratcliffe, and Johanna Pothig. Mercury 20 is a artist run gallery in Oakland on 25th Street off of Telegraph and has been a vibrant part of the Bay Area art scene for 14 years now. So we're gonna start with telling you a little bit about ourselves and then go into a presentation of our, our work that relates to uh, the images in this exhibition. Um, so let's start with Kathleen King and uh, Kathleen, tell us something about yourself. All right, it's me, uh, Kathleen King. I'm an artist born and raised in Oakland, California. I went to grammar school and high school in Oakland and I really wanted to be an artist. So after high school, I enrolled in the California College of Arts and Crafts. You know, I waitress to support myself and pay tuition. And at a certain point I ran out of money. So I had to drop out a couple times and work to save enough money to go back. I transferred to UC Berkeley where I earned my BA in art. Took me seven years to graduate from college, but I got to study with Joan Brown and Michael McClure and Elmer Bischoff, so it was all good. Um, after college, I went to work. For many years, I worked in publishing and advertising as a graphic designer and production artist at alternative newspapers and ad agencies. And I did a lot of pro bono work for lefty political organizations. I followed and participated in the punk and gay scenes of that time. Unfortunately, I lost many friends and colleagues in the AIDS epidemic. Throughout the 90s, I was a working mother. I followed the Bay Area art scene on the periphery, going to galleries and museum shows, researching on websites, reading zines and art magazines. But then around 2000, I had the urge to make my own work again. I thought maybe after all this living, you know, I might have something to say. So I took a class with an artist and teacher named Janet Lipkin. She really helped me. She got me back up on the horse, as she said, and I've been making art seriously for the last 20 years. Uh, over the years, my work has evolved. I started out doing improvisational painting and currently I make assemblages, sculpture and installation from found materials, uh, from materials that I found in the street in the discard piles of the Bay Area. My lifetime of personal connection with the artistic, political and social history of this place, the Bay Area, informs the art that I make. I'll get into that a little bit more later. Um, but just to wrap up, in 2006, I was invited to join a newly forming artist-run gallery in Oakland. Uh, I'm a founding member of Mercury 20 Gallery, and I've exhibited my work regularly in that venue for 14 years. I'm honored to be able to work with my fellow artists to exhibit and advance our work through this collective organization. Great, thanks. How about okay. uh, you, Chris? Chris Kamater. Well, hey, everybody. Uh, thanks for joining us today. I'm Chris Kamater, a visual artist living and working in San Francisco. Uh, my work explores how our culture defines and frames masculinity and male desire. Since 1997, I've been photographing the male body, often extremely close up and then assembling the images into these large abstract arrays or grids. I've focused my gaze on men with body types that have been given little positive visibility in the mainstream or as artistic subject matter, like her suit, mature, um, differently proportioned. Through abstraction, I've created a kind of access, an equivalent sensual and visual experience of the body that takes us away from what we think we might know about it. Um, since 2016, I've continued working with the grid, but this time as extreme low resolution photographs blown up very large. The pixel is my building block and, it, and um, it's usually around two to three inches square. Uh, living in an age in which every aspect of our personal lives is documented and commented on, I make pictures whose subject matter is mined from my personal life, art history and memory but obfuscated by the experience of viewing and the desire for meaning. 
meant to frustrate our voyeuristic impulses, the closer one gets to these pictures, the less one knows. So I look forward to sharing some of this work with you after our introductions. And again, thank you for joining us. Great, thanks. How about you, Mary Curtis? Greetings, I'm Mary Curtis Radcliffe. I was born in Chicago and grew up in Michigan. I was fortunate enough to go to high school for a couple of years in Europe and then attended the Rhode Island School of Design major, majoring in sculpture. In 1967, I went to New York where I became one of the three founding members of a video collective called the Video Freaks. We got a grant from CBS and we traveled all over the country documenting the avant-garde counterculture of the late 60s. I came to San Francisco in 19, eight, uh, 1973, and my first job was, was with the Renaissance Fair in the costume and prop department. I then developed my own pinwheel concession. The pinwheels were displayed on a large circular rack uh, with many ribbons dripping down. And one day I lifted that rack off the wall at about a 45 degree angle. And I saw these ribbons dripping down like this and cascading down to the floor. And I sat down and did a, a series of about 10 drawings very quickly. And that became my very first series of kinetic sculptures. Taking many different jobs to survive over the years, I mostly taught art to children. I had gotten a degree in, in art education from the Rhode Island School of Design as well. And I continued doing my sculpture about, for about 25 years. Then I got into, um, for about 20 years, I did mixed media works on paper using photography, um, painting, drawing, collage, and transfer. And then in the last uh, five years, I returned to kinetic sculpture. But now I was incorporating my, my photography in the imagery. These works have a very gentle, quiet vibration that has a healing element to it and are suited to fostering resilience in people in hospitals, under stress, and whether wherever healing environments are or sheltering at, in place at home. Thank you very much. Thanks so much, Mary Curtis. Um, I'm Johanna Potig and I'm a storyteller and sometimes called a manghuhula. I use my skills of representation and conceptual thinking to create stages, both in public space and in galleries. I'm a visual, a public and a performance artist whose work includes murals, paintings, public art, sculpture, text, multimedia installations. I've split my practice between public art, gallery and performance that explore realism and abstract forms, architectural and intimate scales, historic and present day politics, futurist musings, humor and satire, a feminist point of view, collaborative processes and cultural critique. I grew up in the Philippines and have been participating in Filipino American artist collectives and Philippines based arts projects since the 1980s. I moved to Chicago from Manila in my teens, my mid teens, and was influenced by both the mural and the improvised experimental music scene, especially on the South side. I moved to California to go to UC Santa Cruz and after I graduated, I spent 10 years exhibiting my paintings, working in public space as a muralist, as well as in diverse communities as an artist activist. In 1992, I got my MFA from Mills College. And years later, I'm now profess Professor Emerita uh, of the Visual and Public Art Department at California State University, Monterey Bay. <clears throat> as a matter of fact, I was one of the founding faculty of that program. My wide ranging gallery and performance art investigates issues involving consumer capitalism, colonization, American empire, identity and glamour, science and predictive practices. The centerpiece of my visual art practice is design and competition, 
compos no, composition, composition. The centerpiece of my visual art practice is design and composition that can hold complex ideas in simplified forms. Improvisation, experiments and collaboration and interaction, comedy and a search for collective joy inform my social practice and performance art. In my current work, the mathematical patterns of nature's terrestrial and extraterrestrial life systems expand concepts of time, which I express by creating experiential landscapes and surrealistic portraits in a cross current of speculative storytelling. In the midst of climate crisis, social turmoil and manipulation of truth, my focus has turned towards our environment and our shared planet. So that's who we are. And now we're gonna talk a little bit about our work. Um, so this is my work here. I'm uh, in my work, I create an abstract language that uses symbol and form to communicate ideas and even idealism. I also work with the pragmatism and multiplicity of life on the city streets. This sculpture is called heterotopian enclosure. It's made of found wood beams and clothing that I picked up on the streets of Oakland. I look for the form that emerges from the informal. So here's a little bit about my process. I hunt and gather materials on daily journeys throughout the Bay Area. I also get inspiration from things I see in my wanderings, as well as from beloved artists, uh, current and past, and I take a lot of photos along the way. Uh, here's a photo I took of a wood pile on a construction site. Wood is a favorite, favorite material. I often scavenge through piles like this and I drag pieces back to my studio. The next image is a photo I took one day when I was poking around uh, 40th and Broadway and I saw stacked lumber wood at, uh, wood at a lumber yard. Um, next is a photo of the Ellsworth Kellys at SF MoMA. I spent a lot of time researching in modernism and postmodernism. So specifically, these materials, inspirations and study came together over time with other ideas about the strength of an interlocking structure and the solidarity of the masses. And in the next image, uh, is all these threads came together and I made this assemblage titled All One Sun. It's 50 by 60 inches. It's strong and it breathes. So the next image is an installation shot of my solo show at Mercury 20 Gallery titled So This from 2018. The title comes from an Iggy Pop song and the lines go, they say, so what? I say, so this. Your honest face, your quiet, simple grace, you are one thing I will not waste. So the poet, punk, philosopher, Iggy Pop is a favorite resistance fighter of mine. The next piece is titled Margin. Sometimes my titles give a clue to help with reading the abstract language. It's composed of found materials arranged on the gallery floor. It refers to the lines and margins of a book, as well as people living on the margin. In the next image, people view the work on First Friday. The guy's pointing to a sweatshirt hood, a hoodie, a, po a very potent symbol. So the next image is of the monuments to the precariat sculptures. They focus on the reality of economic instability and precarity, as well as the pulling down of racist monuments across the country. The design is a, a found patchwork. You could call it an asymmetrical pattern. It's using a kind of a rainbow found color palette. I most often use structural techniques based in arrangement, like interlocking, piling, stacking, hanging, tying, or leaning. In this work, the elements are stacked, which demonstrates a kind of unforced contingency. The towers have a feeling of something present at its own making. The next image, you might call it a fugitive planning as another poet philosopher I've been reading, Fred Moten would call it. Moten says we all 
want a life indifference in the play of the general antagonism. We will find a joy in our difference, all that it is and all that we become. This photo shows the sculptures on the sidewalk in front of Dream Farm Commons, another wonderful gallery and community space in Oakland. Great, thanks Kathy. Um, I'm gonna present my work next. Um, so over the years, I've become increasingly fascinated by the algorithmic beauty of plants. Philotaxis is the spatial and temporal arrangement of leaves or petals around a stem or plant axis. Peristiki is the invisible spiral line connecting a series of leaves on a stem that creates an effect on the human eye. Plants challenge our perception. The surreal gardens that I paint overlay organically drawn plants and mathematically generated computer models of plant algorithm, algorithms mixing realism and abstraction. To quote the curatorial statement of the exhibit, The Botanical Mind, now at the Camden Art Center in London, nowadays, contemporary artists are re-engaging with both sacred and secular aspects of plant thinking and being and finding in the plant kingdom new models for thinking about life and consciousness, as well as increasingly diverse ethical, social, scientific, and aesthetic approaches to the more than human world. This invites us to reflect on our own relationship with plants and what they can teach us about ourselves and how we might share our world with them. I've approached this body of work in three ways, using scale, narrative, and interaction. Painting at both large and small scale, I mix the phylotactic patterns with renderings of plants to draw attention to what we're really perceiving when we look out over a landscape or in the natural world. In this recent painting, which is 84 inches by 84 inches, it allows the viewer to enter the visual landscape and um, you know, be part of the painting itself. I find that the shapes, when they're introduced into um, these compositions open up the space and create so much movement. So it, it, to me, it really um, begins to act like the world around me uh, and nature when I look at it, the movement of the plants and the way that they face the sun and the way they point to it as because in, plants basically transform light from the sun in a, a kind of an everyday alchemy. So as I explore the visual field, I started to look at these plants as like satellite, they, they look like satellite dishes to me with their face towards space. So I started to imagine them as earth stations, especially in the way that we're isolated right now. I feel like we're all in our little earth stations communicating across the planet. This phylotactic, um, this is another uh, example of my earth station paintings. And here is another one. This phylotactic oculus in my mural skylight at CSUMB opens up the perception uh, and challenges the linearity of this building. I'm very interested in architecture and, and how art becomes part of the environment and how physically and socially that transforms us. Architecture, our urban spaces, the places that we live in affect who we are as individuals and as a society. And as a public artist, that's really interested me. And my work in my studio and in public space always go back and forth. If I do one thing in one place, it, it's, it communicates, it has a conversation. In the scale of our body, uh, this is another uh, approach or part of my approach, uh, paintings become stages, especially because I've done all these murals where people are part of the, the painting. But in my in galleries and in my studio too, the paintings become stages or backdrops for a kind of a theatrical interaction. I created these masks with plant patterns that allow us to hide from social media algorithms and guard against the totalitarian states, which are increasingly threatening us around the world in an era of climate crisis. We're really in a fight against uh, that kind of reality or potential future. I engage viewers to use the masks and become part of the work. I act, when I started doing this, I started drawing people as plants so that we could understand that we are not 
that we are terrestrials, that our future is um, hinges on what happens uh, all over the planet. So the planet is not our stage, but we are bound to it for our survival. So here are some more portraits where I start to try to imagine um, what flight these life forms can teach us about uh, with their encoded vegetal intelligence. As a, so here are some other portraits. This is me as a plant guardian kind of warrior. And here's another portrait, a uh, plant portrait where I've started to use the, the non-woven media and put wire in it so that the, the actual medium or the, the substrate is like a leaf. It acts like the plant itself. And here are some other plant portraits. So as a storyteller, I'm now working on a zine called the Quasi Extra Terra Tropozine and a, and a series of volumes called Terrestrial Terminal Earth Station. These are fabulous fictions that chronicle the rise of the terrestrial terminal earth stations and their new symbiotic life forms. Rising out of the wreckage of climate crisis and cargo cult capitalism, skillfully orchestrated by terraqueous, troposphere, extraterrestrial, in collaboration with time, all major players in the cosmos. Epic stories have shaped cultures and our species. These plant patterns relate to an ancient metaphysics found across civilizations and through time. Connected by principles of micro and macro cosmos, fractal geometries, and plant medicines. The paintings and figurative work are designed with text and their writing enables me to synthesize my research and my visual uh, create pieces uh, and create a speculative fiction that unfolds as the times around us develop and that, we're, that we live through. It's another scale, it's physically small, but conceptually unlimited. Thanks. Uh, Chris, let's see. Oh, here is the book, by the way. I'm sorry I started. Okay. Um, so I'd like to introduce selections from two recent bodies of work, Sexting and Family Album. Sexting, which you're looking at here, consists of extremely low resolution enlargements of images shared through the internet over the course of my recent dating experiences. So from a distance, it's almost possible to make out what's being described, but as the viewer is drawn closer, the images fall apart into pixelated near abstract grids of colored squares. So this is called Rob in his bath. Um, other titles are a little more of me, big furry gray belly, white socks, white boxers, etc. Uh, this piece is called Nemmer, hairy chest. And this is called uh, Tented Speedos, Ikaria. This image is titled Squirt, uh, potentially the most graphic image, yet at the same time, just a bunch of colored squares. While the titles are meant to titillate, like the process of seeking intimacy on the internet, the viewer's titillation is ultimately frustrated by the experience of trying to give form to one's imagination. So the photo series family album, um, this is my most recent body of work, consists of uh, large scale, low resolution images culled from my family history. Digital photography and the camera phone make it possible to document almost every moment of our lives. But prior to the digital image, there was film. And for 60 years, my father meticulously documented the major events in our family's life with Kodachrome and Ektachrome slides. Following the recent passing of both of my parents and my older sister, I've chosen a few of these images and produced low resolution enlargements. So this piece is called Carol Island Lake, Michigan, 1958. There's a, a specificity in the titles that you'll notice is not present in the imagery. There's nothing to signify gender, personality, location, no uh, discernible or specific details. 
This piece is called Me and Teddy, Gadsden, Alabama, 1969. It's one of the few black and white images that I have that dad took of me. And uh, black and white for me has always meant the past. And here I am located in some distant moment, yet I have no memory of this exchange between me and my father other than this record of his picture taking. The ranging in resolution from easily to barely recognizable, the images mirror the process of our loved ones disappearing from our lives. I'm asking my viewer to look past the specific content of these images and to experience the gradual transformation of meaning and memory attached to them. So thanks for letting me share some of my work with you. Um, I hope to see you all at the Mercury 20 Gallery in Oakland when it's safe for all of us to get together again. Thanks, Chris. My name is Mary Curtis Ratcliffe and in the last five years, I have developed a series of kinetic sculptures that are suspended from the ceiling individually and they turn in space. This first one you see is called Windbreak. I spread an image that, um, through drawing over the, the membrane of three separate 16 inch circular panels. And um, they were taken from a photograph that I took in, in an artist residency on the North Island of New Zealand. When I saw them turn in space, it reminded me of um, a series that I had done over 40 years ago of kinetic sculptures. And um, the next piece is called Hollywood Car Wash. It's about 12 feet long and 30 inches in diameter and made of Japanese ribbon dripping down. And um, it was, um, moves from the wind in this particular incidence. After the first piece, um, three clouds fo followed. And these are photographic images of clouds that I took over the years because I take series of photographs of various things and clouds are one of them. They are suspended again and the, in this case, if they're lit, lit well, the shadows interact with each other and it, it's a sculpture that never stops moving and, and is always in motion. With skylight, this is um, a photographic image that was printed on a 48 inch wide piece of plexiglass. And in this piece, um, I wanted to have shadows as well. And I uh, um, accomplished that by making a lot of transparency in this image. So again, it, it rotates in space. And followed by this piece using the idea of transparency is koi. And these are printed onto um, polyester and adhered to stainless steel frames. And again, they have in an interaction with the shadow. Same with the next piece called jellies. These are photographic images of jellies that I took at the Monterey Bay Aquarium and the oak branch was from Sonoma County. I did many years ago. So I have a huge archive of photographs, which I can draw on. And then I did a piece more recently called Exoplanets. So you can see it's the same image in a different size using different colors, light blue and blue, dark blue and green. And then um, I painted and, and then used colored pencil to a great degree in this piece. And then the last piece is called Technicolor Trees. And it has an abstract depiction of tree branches painted on in, in the vi very vivid colors on the plexiglass. Again, taking advantage of 
transparency and the forms of the shadows that overlap in this particular case. These works can activate spaces by their motion and benefit people with their gentle healing vibration, especially in these times when we are also in need of a calming rhythms of nature. Thank you. Great. Ask each other uh, a few questions and see if we can talk a little bit about our work. Um, does anybody want to start? Um, sure, I will. <laughs> um, I have a question for uh, you, Johanna. Well, not really a question, but I'm wondering if you could tell us a little more, Johanna, about the performative aspect of your work um, as it relates to the paintings that we My saw. performance comes out of um, ideas around costume and, um, and <laughs> sort of visual ideas that I'm working with. Uh, I'll get an idea of what people are going to wear, and then all of a sudden I'll have all these ideas for painting. So it, it's this conversation that goes. So then I make the props or the perhaps the way that people are going to interact with the background, and the audience in a way becomes become performers in the in the work, and uh, maybe I also perform something or I put. And I've also put together um, performance events. But I think it has a lot to do also with working with public and in the public space where I also feel like there's this uh, engagement, this improvisation. The thing that I really like to do and the, the way that music has really affected my work is the idea of improvisation. I feel like when we learn to improvise, when we learn to, to interact with each other and with what's around us, we are able to break down hierarchies and in a larger political sense, I believe that's how we create democracies. So there's a sort of political thing underneath it, but it's also about having fun and dressing up and having theater, you know? So that's, that's what it is. Um, I had a question for you while we're having this conversation. I've always been really curious about um, how you, um, you know, use the pixel and how you construct uh, the um, images that you that you do with the pixelation. Sure. Well, the um, my prints are more like uh, transcriptions of low resolution photographs because uh, you can't really print something that's about this big mm -hmm. and blow it up with any kind of uh, clarity. So what I do is I I reduce my image to you know. 10 by 12 pixels, 16 by 18 pixels. And then, um, and then I visually enlarge it. And then I take the color information in each pixel and transfer it to a, a, a grid that I've made um, using Photoshop. So I'm basically filling in each square with the, the average color information that is represented by each pixel. Um, and then, you know, because I want really sharp lines and I have like a little thin white line between every pixel. Um, so uh, for me, it combines photography and painting, even though it's like digital painting um, as a, well, like in studying photography, you know, we learned about the, when I mean, the early days of photography or after photography was invented in 1839, um, there was this kind of, not really conflict, but competition between uh, painting and photography. I'm amazed at how those squares can actually, you can actually see something. So, so Yeah, it's cool. magical. It's magical. Like I take my glasses off and I can see the image perfectly. <laughs> and then I put my glasses back on and then it's just squares again. It is kind of amazing what the eyes can do. Um, I mean, just a, just you know, 80 little squares next to each other and yeah. your eye wants to, wants to exactly. figure it out. Yeah. Yeah. Right, right. Your brain. I have a question for Kathy. Okay. Kathy, uh, which direction are you going in next? I, I was making collages during the shelter in place. They're small and e kind of easy to do and in a small place at home. Um, I've been making tape drawings and I'm blowing up, making the tape drawings bigger, making tape paintings now. Um, so I'm just um, using tape and paint to create these abstract um, sort of continuous variation paintings. 
And yeah, the thing I thought about today was just to take photos, like to, because I had, I did this before. I, when I was on my residency, um, I, I gathered a whole bunch of stuff and I just put it on a table and arranged it. Cause you know, a lot of my work's about arrangement. And then I just yeah. shot it from above and I just thought, oh, I could just, I find all these things and just the arrangement and the juxtaposition and the, the pieces, the little pieces talking to each other would make great photos. So <laughs> who knows what's coming? I never know. Um, my question for you, Curtis, is that um, I think that the movement allows the viewer to kind of let go and become more connected to the surrounding space and the atmosphere and the things that are going on around them. It, it sort of expands them and lets them let go. And is that how healing is somewhat facilitated? Yes, um, what happened was um, I was um, kind of uh, resting on underneath one of the sculptures, the three clouds sculptures, um, a sculpture. And I began to actually watch it. And I began, it was moving very quietly and gently. And I watched it for a long time. And I began to realize that that's what was happening from these kind of quiet emanations were coming from the sculpture. And so what it does and what I'd like it to do for other people is if they will concentrate on it for a certain period of time, their minds will begin to relax because um, if you're watching it, it's totally interactive and, and um, in a very um, gentle way. And so um, I've had people tell me that their blood pressure has gone down. They actually <laughs> measured their blood pressure first and then they <laughs> measured it later. And it, it just brought it down in a very nice kind of way. And so it's kind of like a respite. Right. Just stand there for maybe three minutes and just watch this piece of sculpture move in space. And, you know, your worries might be uh, suspended for a certain period of time. Well, the, uh, the Arte Bovera artists from the 60s, right. the Italian artists. And then, right, right, as I was questioning, yeah. And then the, um, in, in Japan, there was a similar movement called Mano Ha. Mm -hmm. which is, is, is a lot like it. Um, yeah, it's, it, you know, um, when I, it's, it's kind of a long story, but when I was painting, you know, you're painting, you're making an image. And when I was young, I was image making, striving, you know, um, trying, and my friend said, are you trying to seek transcendence? Because that's in the canon, you know, they say abstract painters trying to seek transcendence. And I thought to myself, God, no, not any, if I was, not anymore. What am I seeking, you know? Well, it's imminent, it's the opposite, which is imminence, which is being in, on, and with everything around you. And, you know, um, the idea of things, you know, the, the um, sort of like the, the God in things, you know? Um, so uh, that's kind of what Arte Povera and Manoha do. They find that, um, imminence in things and, and the two bodies of work I, I like how they contrast each other uh using the same idea but in different ways different motivations uh, for each body of work so like in sexting people want to know what these images are right. you know, I mean, because the, the titles title. are pretty can be pretty sexy mm -hmm. so it's like there's this this you know wanting to to have more information wanting to see more detail whereas the images of my family, um, for me, it's about losing that detail and I mean, losing them, losing memories and not, uh, I mean, having to let go of that. And it's, you know, just represented in the visual here since I'm a visual artist. Mm -hmm. So I think, uh, you know, that's, I, I guess that's how I, I see the difference is, is just in how they're, what we want out of the photographs. <laughs> And I am pushing my envelope all over the place, making this new work. And it's there, I have to paint both sides 
of, of the, um, the circular form. So I have 10 surfaces to paint and I am just doing the best I can and really having a lot of fun. And um, I, you know, I'll be really curious to see what happens and, and hopefully I'll like it. <laughs> Well, one of the things we always say about being artists at, um, at Mercury 20 is you can experiment. How we've managed or how being an artist during this quarantine and during this pandemic has unfolded. Man, it's such a roller coaster ride, really. I mean, at first I was all excited and I got to spend time alone, you know, and do my thing and, you know, do less, so many less distractions. And then I got really sad and I missed everybody, you know, um, but, and there's all these substitutions like, you know, Zoom meetings and Zoom dinners and uh, Zoom coffee clashes and stuff that you have with people. But so now what am I gonna do? So I went to the studio and I started looking around and I started opening flat file drawers. And in one of the drawers, I found all these scraps that I had saved over maybe the last 15 years. And I've done 29 works. <laughs> I think stuff that has cluttered my art making process, you know, just uh, my studio and my house. It's like, I'm sort of dealing with things other than art right now. And it feels great because now it just seems like everything is like the, the palette is empty and now I can really start creating. The main thing I miss is seeing actual art um, and you know, being around my friends and other artists. But you know, there's a Artemisia Gentileschi show in London uh, right now. And one of her pieces is called Allegory of Inclination. <laughs> and I just love that title. So I don't know what I'm gonna do with it, but my next show will be called Allegory of Inclination just because I love the possibilities. <laughs> Mm -hmm. Stay tuned. But I feel like if we can create better stories about being part of the planet, and I've been reading a lot of philosophers and, and, and thinkers around that, um, we'll be able to, we, we see how powerful stories are that we've gotten into this mess in the United States and in the world. So I feel like as artists, by um, imagining uh, better ways to live and, and sort of problem solving in ways that might be fantastical or, you know, fabulous or whatever, but there's always a kernel of truth to it. There's always something in there that we can uh, offer or, you know, by thinking really differently, we can look at what's, what we're, what we need to solve. And, and so the pandemic has really, you know, been a very difficult, but also very thoughtful time for me you know, and I've gotten a, fair, a lot of work done. So anyway, here we are on Zoom, zooming in. And um, it's great to do this with you all. all right. Yeah, great. thank you, everybody. It's great to see you thank all. Thank you. Yeah. All right, well. We hope to see you all at Mercury 20 Gallery in the future. That's yeah. right. It's in that future. In, your in, that, <laughs> in that future. Bye-bye. See you guys Bye, later. Bye, everybody.